defiance of tradition, defiance of authority. And the civilizations in the West have really emphasized the group and really regard our uh, emphasis on individuality as subversive and mistrustful and chaotic, as indeed all the great uh, high civilizations have so regarded it. Now Campbell begins the essay. Keep in mind he's an American scholar and uh, he's participating in the Aramis <coughs> conferences and all the scholars are Europeans. I think he's probably the first or maybe the second American to have given a lecture there. I think there was still some of the European uh, provincial kind of disregard for Americans as a bunch of tinkerers uh, without any real intellect. So Campbell sort of has to, he has that image in store for him when he comes in and begins to uh, give his essay. So he starts off with this kind of self-effacing image. He says, uh, it was Bertrand Russell, as I once recall, who told a New York audience that all Americans believe that the world was created in 1492 and redeemed in 1776. And so he sort of starts off with that American provincial attitude, uh, the old attitude of American isolationism. And um, then he goes on and he says, um, that may account for what I'm about to do, which is to show the origin and evolution of the mandala, but also its disintegration. And he ends up the essay by saying that, uh, indeed, the modern world was created in 1492 and uh, redeemed in many ways in 1776. And he says, uh, 1492 is the period of Columbus, and it was precisely the voyages of Columbus that began to disintegrate the great mandalic images of the world's traditions. Which I would like now to, uh, I want to take a five minute break and then come back and look at a series of maps that show Columbus, uh, starting with Columbus, or the events leading up to Columbus's uh, sort of, as it were, uh, cutting of the world binding dragon biting its tail and breaking open these old uh, provincial uh, mandala cosmologies and leading us off into the sort of world without horizons that we're all inhabiting uh, now, which is the Promethean endeavor of Northern European uh, civilization versus the emphasis on tradition and convention. Burned, yes, many people were. <laughs> kind of like what's going on right now with women in this is the oldest map in the world it's back to about uh, 500 BC although the cosmology of it is probably much older, it probably goes back uh, must be a thousand or two years before that. And uh, <clears throat> it looks very quaint to us today. Uh, what it is is a map of Babylon, and this is Babylon here in the center, and this, these are the Tigris and Euphrates rivers flowing right along, and these out here are various nearby cities. And the world is conceived here as a kind of island floating on the world ocean. And um, this is an abstract version of the world ocean in the Greek tradition. Ocean is the god Okeanos, which is a gigantic serpent biting its tail. That's this thing right here, which traditionally has been the image of the boundaries of the world. It's a gigantic serpent. And that's why um, we get all these great, wonderful stories of sailors going out and always encountering sea serpents, because the sea serpent was the personification of the limits past which you could not venture. And um, it's one of my favorite images of such an encounter. This is from the story of St. Brendan's voyage. And St. Brendan was uh, an Irish monk who went in quest of the Blessed Isles. Now the Celts uh, are very interesting because there is some evidence that they discovered America even before the Vikings did. That's something you won't hear taught in many classrooms. But the voyage of St. Brendan, when you read it, actually may be a record of such a journey from Ireland to America. Um, Brendan leaves, and uh, one of my favorite episodes is not too long after he's going along, they come across this gigantic island, and they all get off the boat, and they get onto it, and they set up an altar, and they say mass. And uh, right in the middle of the mass, the thing starts to wake up, and it turns out to be a gigantic uh, leviathanic sea beast. And uh, they all have to get back in the boat and leave very quickly. And that wonderful image of sort of 
Christianity's denial of nature is uh, it, the world is the, the sea beast itself, and um, it's sort of founded out of that uh, principle of the, the instincts of the body. The monster is the body's instincts. The reptilian uh, brainstem, from out of which we have evolved, we were reptiles at one time. And it is possible that the image of the great uh, leviathans in our mythology are recognitions of our evolutionary uh, development from the reptilian brainstem. And uh, this is also the first thing you encounter in uh, the Sinbad voyages. I don't know if anybody's read those. The first voyage of Sinbad. It's probably taken from this. Uh, he lands on a on a, an island, and it turns out to be this great sea beast, and he gets separated from his crew, and uh, from that point on goes off on his adventures. And that was probably taken from uh, the voyage of St. Brendan. And the Vikings were said, when, uh, when they landed on Greenland, were said to have encountered uh, a group of Celtic monks who had already beaten them to it. And there is evidence among some of the names on uh, maps, if you look, uh, I think it's in Nova Scotia, or areas thereabout, there are these uh, Celtic place names that are very curious, have resonances with Arthurian myths, and you, you begin to wonder about the possibility of the Celts uh, having sailed all the way over here uh, prior to the Viking voyages in 1000. Now, the image on the Babylonian map, recall, was um, Babylon was the center of the world, and in all these great traditions, the primary image is that my city is at the center of the world. Everything else is provincial. And uh, here we have the image of the world about the time of Homer. And here we have Mount Olympus as the center of the world, where on the Babylonian map, Babylon was at the center of the world. Uh, culture has migrated westward, you might say, also from the riverine uh, worldview of the uh, Egyptians and the Babylonians to the Mediterranean worldview, uh, which eventually has produced our northern European civilization. And uh, the serpent is also not present here. This map is a reconstruction based on clues from Homeric texts. But um, the world is just a sort of gigantic Mediterranean. And here you have Asia, as briefly alluded to, and Africa and uh, Europe. These are mandalas. Notice that each of these images um, is the image of a mandala. The world is conceived as a mandala. And here is the uh, medieval vision of the world, where again, though you can't see it in this map, you'll see it in the next one. Jerusalem is now the center of the world. And here is Asia in what in our maps would be the north. Uh, the old principle to orient yourself comes from the recognition that the Orient was the center of the world because it was the home of Jerusalem. And so maps the north, what would be north for us is uh, the Orient. And uh, the world here is simplified into three continents. You have Europe, Africa, and Asia. And each one of these is populated by the descendants of the three sons of Noah. Uh, the Semites are the descendants of Shem in Asia. And you have Europa, uh, Japheth, and uh, the descendants of Japheth. And uh, Europa is, of course, named after uh, the uh, Greek figure Europa, who was kidnapped by Z Zeus, who had taken on the form of a white bull. And uh, he just says, get on. She hops on the back, and they go off and uh, produce King Minos and his brothers. And um, Africa, which is named after a figure named, an obscure biblical figure named Aether, a male figure, um, who is a descendant of uh, Ham. And uh, Africa is the land of the Hamites. And so uh, that was what the world looked like. And here, of course, is the world encircling serpent ocean. And these are called T&O maps. And this is the Mediterranean right here, Europe and Africa. And the crossbar of the T was regarded essentially as uh, the Danube flowing down into the Nile. You can see that the geographical knowledge wasn't very good. But at this time, it didn't matter. The ecclesiastical emphasis was what mattered. The world was a spiritual vision. And um, notice also that we have two women. This Asia is named after a queen, Queen Asia. And Europa is female. And uh, Africa is named after a man, Aether. That will turn out to be significant in a moment. That is the schematized version of this image, which is filled in with more detail. Sort of uh, Christ of the Apocalypse uh, over the T and O. And here, you can make out the T has been slightly decentered. But this is clear because Jerusalem now is at the bullseye, where Babylon was the bullseye on the riverine map, and uh, where Mount Olympus was for the Greeks. 
And um, here you can see all the various crazy tribes of Africa. There are all these sort of malformed, deformed creatures. The basis for racism uh, for the taking of slaves from Africa is very deep in the Western tradition. 